before you had ever heard the name Taylor Swift, there was, and still is, a Mariah Carey. Uh, anyone, anyone out there? Anyone, anyone? Uh, and she has a, a famous song that we're not gonna talk about, All I Want for Christmas is You. Not gonna talk about that one. <laughs> gonna talk about another one of her songs where she sings these words. Are you ready? This is what she sings in one of her more well-known songs. If you look inside your heart, you don't have to be afraid of what you are. There's an answer if you reach into your soul and the sorrow that you know will melt away. And then a hero comes along with the strength to carry on. And you cast your fears aside and you know you can survive. So when you feel like hope is gone, look inside you and be strong and you'll finally see the truth. Now what's the next line? Anyone? Any Mariah Carey fans in the house? That a hero lies in you. What a load of crap. <laughs> what an absolute crock. Do not believe that. You fathers here this morning, you know that there are times where you need to summon the energy, the resolve, the right word, an apt response to your child. And there is no hero to be found, am I right? I mean, it's just like, no, no. I got rage. I got sarcasm, I got vitriol, right? But I'm, I'm trying to find, I'm looking deep, Mariah. I got nothing that resembles hero. And this, this in lyrical form has, has been expressed, this kind of mantra of the age has been expressed uh, in, in book form. I've referenced it a couple other times, but, but Carl Truman says this, the kind of the changes within our culture and how we view ourselves and we've, how we've come to believe what we believe, these developments, these changes within culture lead to a prioritization of the individual's inner psychology, we might say feelings or intuitions for our sense of who we are and what is the purpose of our lives. A mimetic view, what is that? Well, a mimetic view of the world regards the world as having a given order and a given meaning and thus sees human beings as required to discover that meaning and conform themselves to it. Poesis by way of contrast, sees the world as uh, so much raw material out of which meaning and purpose can be created by the individual. Mimetic, there is an order. We don't create it. It is given to us. We simply discover what it is and then work to conform our lives to that given order. Different way of viewing the world is to say, it's just randomness, haphazardness, raw material, and we get to figure it out. He continues, the individual in this second view where we create it, right? That person is king or queen or hero. He or she can be whomever they want to be and rejecting the notion of any external authority or meaning to which education or therapy or other out external um, prerogatives, right? is to conform to. The individual simply makes himself or herself the creator of any meaning that there might be so-called uh, external or objective truths are then simply constructs designed by the powerful to intimidate and to harm the weak. You do you, if it makes you happy, right? So this is, this is kind of the feeling and thinking of our age, the cultural waters that we swim in and then I come before you this morning standing on a stage to highlight 
hey, that's a load of crap, <laughs> right? I then be, can be depicted as this authority to intimidate or even worse, to harm you. Thankfully, it's not my story, but we're going to look at the story of God and the story of Jesus, and we'll let Jesus depict authority. And we are in our summer series. We're moving away from Romans for a time here because, uh, you know, look around. There's actually room in the pews. This is a beautiful thing. can stretch out. But each of our summer series don't piggyback on one another in the same way our, our uh spring series on the book of Romans did. And this allows us just to kind of look at individual stories uh, within Jesus's life where he teaches, he heals, he performs miracles. He talk to, talks about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And we get to understand and, and see these things, but then ultimately Jesus is pushing for a response. If you're uh, just looking for a quick summary of this series, let me read it here. From songs and novels to movies and TV, there is something unique about the power of stories and their ability to resonate within our hearts in compelling and moving ways. In the Gospels, we see many accounts of Jesus telling parables and reimagining stories to teach, equip, and win the hearts of his hearers. And yet Jesus wasn't a mere teacher or storyteller, but one who communicated and is himself the power of God for salvation. This summer, we examine what makes the stories of Jesus so unique, powerful, and life-giving to us today. Something powerful happens as we encounter God's word. It does intend to be authoritative from outside of us. It does intend to put forth an order of the world that we are called to conform to. And therefore, you and I, as products of this society, come in here with an aversion to what's going to be shared from on stage every week. Why? because that's not the waters we swim in. Every day you are inundated with marketing, with commercials, with social media that says, you're the king, you're the queen, you're the hero of the story. And we meet something very, very different in the scriptures. And yet, so many times, Jesus has asked direct questions and he responds with indirect answers. <laughs> he invites us closer. He invites us by sharing a parable, a story, a metaphor, a simile. And all of a sudden we kind of have to say, huh, what did that mean? <laughs> and what is he implying with what he said there? And we have that this morning. We're actually going to cover one of, those, one of those passages where part of it, I've skipped so many times, right? You, get, you, you ever read your Bible and all of a sudden you get to you know, a few verses and you're like, what could that possibly mean? And you're like, eh, I'm just gonna keep reading. That's, that's what we have in part of today's passage. Let me summarize, because we're not gonna read through the whole thing and then go back through it. We're just gonna go through it. But let me summarize what's been happening. So Jesus is born, he comes on the scene, right? John the Baptist is a forerunner, a person who's sent before the Messiah to declare, hey, the one who's coming after me, big deal, get ready. Okay, at the point that we are in the story though, where is John the Baptist? He's imprisoned. So on account of his imprisonment and the fact that he's not been set free, he's saying, hey, uh, a few of my disciples, can you, can you go talk to that Jesus guy? And can you ask him like, are you actually the one? I just need to know because I'm sitting in a prison. And I don't want to be, you know, here, sitting here, but then possibly dying for the person who's not the one. I came to be a forerunner to the, to the one. Okay, so we see that kind of play out. His disciples bring that to Jesus and Jesus responds. And he says, go back and report what you've seen and heard. I've been doing all these miracles. Go let it be known back there. And so they're going to return and do that. So then Jesus turns to the crowd and says, hey, let me tell you about John. Let me tell you about who he is. He's a prophet. Yeah, and I got a couple other things to say about him. And as he talks about John, John the Baptist, and John's baptism, all of a sudden the crowd breaks into two groups. Those who accepted John the Baptist's baptism of repentance and those who haven't. 
Okay, and that, that's intriguing. That brings in some contrast, a little bit of tension into our story this morning. And then ultimately, what was the first question that we started with? Are you the one? Not is John the Baptist the one, are you Jesus the one, the Messiah? So then Jesus says, and here's the issue. We have two responses to John the Baptist. Guess what? You all are gonna have to respond to the Messiah. You're gonna have to respond to me. You're gonna have to decide, do you think I'm the Messiah? And then he gives this weird little story about children in the marketplace are playing a flute and the people don't dance, okay? Or playing a funeral dirge and the people don't mourn. So they're not getting the response that they want. That's the part that it's like, I'm gonna skip that. I don't really understand that. I'll come back some other time. And then Jesus closed with this unique phrase, wisdom is justified by her children. Huh? And that's the end of our passage for this morning. All right, that's what we're gonna tackle. Here we go. All right, so John's disciples told John about these, all these things. What are all these things? Okay, I'm gonna give you three. Uh, certainly could be more, because it's like, just tell me all the stuff Jesus is doing. There's two stories that come before our account in Luke. One comes after. I'm going to lop that in there because it's indicative of what Jesus' ministry has been doing. So three quick stories that could be included in all these things. One is there's a Roman centurion, a non-Jewish guy that has a ailing, sick servant. And, and that that figure, that Roman guard has been so important in that city that these people of that city are like, wow, we care about him. He's taking care of us. He's built our synagogue. Let's go find Jesus and see if Jesus will heal that guy's servant. And it ends up that this guy understands authority and he says, no, no, no. I shouldn't call you to come over to my place. I know how authority works. If you say the word, it's done. That's how authority works. If you have authority over this disease, you don't have to come and visit him. You just say the word and it's done. And, and the response of Jesus to that Roman, to that non-Jewish person is, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. My own, my own people, the Israelites, they don't exhibit such faith in my authority. So that's number one. Number two of what all these things could be. So we got this Roman centurion, his ailing servant is healed. Number two, there is a widow who is on the way to bury her only son. She doesn't even know that she should be asking Jesus. Jesus just has compassion. Caesar has compassion and raises the dead. One of three resurrections that Jesus performs happens to this widow who lost her only son. Resurrection happens, okay? Third one, actually comes after our account here in Luke 7, is, is a gal who comes into the house where Jesus is dining with a Pharisee, a religious leader, and she ends up uh, wetting Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping them clean with her hair. And Jesus uses this discrepancy between how the Pharisee host, this religious leader has responded to him, versus this gal who bowed before him at his feet, wetting his feet with her tears and then wiping with her hair. And he just kind of teaches in that moment and says, do you see what she shows here? She shows an understanding of the gravity of her sin. She's actually not even named in the story. She's called a woman of the city. She has an understanding of the gravity of her sin. She understands the weightiness. She understands the depth of rescue that's needed, the level and degree of forgiveness that's needed for someone like her. She understands that if, that if I forgive her, she's been forgiven so much. Great sin requires great rescue, great salvation. And by contrast, the religious leader, his sin is not that bad. He doesn't need that much rescue. He doesn't need that much forgiveness. And Jesus prizes this gal. So John's disciples going back and reporting, the authority of Jesus has been demonstrated in this way over disease. His compassion has been shown in raising the dead and his forgiveness, even to a woman of the city. John goes back and reports all these things and probably more to Jesus. John's disciples told him about all these things and then calling two of them, he sent two of his disciples to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come 
Or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Whenever the Bible repeats something, it's important. Here, it's, it, it really frames out our entire passage. Are you the one? Another one of your translations was, uh, would say something like, should we keep waiting? Are you the one or sh should we keep waiting? Waiting for whom? For Messiah, for the really anointed one, for the Christ, for the true savior of our people. Are you the one? Are you the Messiah, the rescuer sent by God, or should we keep waiting? waiting? Should we expect someone else? That is the big question that frames up our entire passage. And now it's time for Jesus to respond. He doesn't respond in direct order. He brings us in. He increases the intrigue and then calls for a personal response for the listener. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind, so he replied to John's disciples, to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Go back, tell John what you yourselves have heard and seen, what you've observed which in all likelihood, they've, they've told John most of this, right? right? We, we already talked about the authority of Jesus being shown over disease and the compassion to raise the dead and the forgiveness of this woman of the city. Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have, heard, who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. They might be thinking to themselves, okay, we, we've kind of reported some of that. I guess we could provide a fuller report. But then this, then this. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now, why would that be in there? Why does Luke, the author, include that for you and for me? Blessed are anybody who are not offended by Jesus, offended by what Jesus does, offended by what they've seen and heard and observed in Jesus and his ministry. Isn't everybody behind healings? Isn't everybody like team healings? Like, aren't we, on the, aren't we all on the same team for, for healings, for, for the leprous being cleansed and the dead being raised? Aren't we all on the same team? Don't we all celebrate that? Couple possibilities, couple possibilities. And, and both I think are at play, but, but one maybe a little bit more significantly. One could be that, that there's a group of people that says, you know what? You should do all of your ministry to the Israelites. If you're a Jew, you should do all of your ministry, all of your healings, all your pro proclamation to them. And so when you take time and energy and power and share that with a centurion, or somebody so sinful, like a woman of the city, people take offense at that. You should come to the spiritual people. You should come to the Israelite people. Could, could be, could be just who Jesus is choosing to heal, how he's exercising authority. They take offense of why he does what he does. Could be. A second option though, is to consider what's lacking from that list. What's not included in that list that John the Baptist would expect that most of the Israelites would be expecting to see? They're, they're listening for it and Jesus didn't proclaim it right here. But if you page back to Luke chapter four, when Jesus starts his earthly ministry, and if you were to page back through the rest of your Old Testament, you just three quarters, the first three quarters of your Bible, you will see a theme repeated again and again and again. What did the Israelites hope for when they were under the thumb of Pharaoh? Freedom from captivity. What are the Israelites experiencing right now? They are under the thumb of the Romans. Where's John the Baptist right now? Imprisoned. So John's disciples return, right? You got, you got to put yourself in the story. And, and John's like, tell me everything. And they're like, 
The blind are receiving sight. The deaf are hearing. The lame are walking. The leprous are being cleansed. John, the dead are being raised. Anything else? Was, was that the entirety of what you heard? Was, was there any other verses that he quoted to you? Oh yeah, yeah. The good news is proclaimed to the poor. Still waiting to hear what I'm hoping to hear. There's, there's, there's these verses. The prophets said it. It's part of our history. I'm in prison right now. You sure there's nothing else to report to me? What about that proclamation of freedom? for the captive, liberty for those in prison. Did, did Jesus say anything about that? No, no, he didn't say anything about that, right? So if you're John the Baptist, part of your disillusionment, part of you sending your disciples, are you the one is like, I'm just trying to make sense of my life right now. And I'm to be a forerunner of the big deal. I'm to pave the way so that you can come behind. And here I sit, imprisoned. And yet we are told the Messiah will set the captive free. John the Baptist's message was of judgment and repentance. That there is gonna be a darkness associated with that on account of sin. We gotta turn from this. Why? Because God's going to bring judgment. Some conceive this as the Messiah is going to bring revolution. When? 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 Where? I'm sitting in a prison. Blessed is anyone, including you, John, who do not stumble on account of me, who don't take offense on account of me, my way of bringing forth Messiah. This uh, idea of kind of a, a hope for Messiah, a, a hope for rescue or a hero of sorts and kind of expectations associated with it has come into view in a recent podcast called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. Anyone? Anyone listening to this podcast? Many of her readers of the Harry Potter series felt seen felt heard. They who were out of place felt like they could identify with characters in her stories. If you hear some of the words, it gave them hope. It gave them a sense of peace, a sense of joy, of belonging, that there was a, a hero, a rescuer of sorts that was kind of depicted through her works. She herself became a type of hero, invited to speak at prestigious universities, to do the grad speech thing. Why? Because you are heroic, Joanne. You depict everything that we want. At that time, at the, the time of her book writing, conservatives discredited her. She was introducing witchcraft and wizardry. But in Modern times, liberals are casting her aside. Why? Because she's not upholding the liber liberal political talking points. At least she's not holding all of them. She holds many of them. And we're not going to go into that this morning. But clearly, they had an expectation of what she should be, of what she should believe as, as kind of the hero as, as kind of the, the faithful representative of a people. And now she's not. And so people have taken offense. The very ones that said, you saw me, you heard me, you gave me hope unlike anyone else. Those very same people are now saying, essentially, you're dead to me. And maybe you should be dead to the world. All sorts of threats she herself is interviewed as part of this podcast. The conservatives hated her. 
Now, many of the liberals hate her. She is not the longed for expected Messiah that they had believed her to be. Our story continues. After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? What's the insinuated answer? No. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. A couple things to note here. So, did you go out to see this reed swayed in the wind? No, no, no. Did you go out to see this kingly person? No, no, no. You went and you... You would see a prophet, and I am confirming that he is the messenger. He is the fulfillment of those Old Testament predictions that there would be one that would be a forerunner, go before the Messiah. John the Baptist is him. So Jesus confirms that. Then there's this concession, this, this unique add-on, this addendum here. Of, and yet I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So in one breath, he says, no one greater, not King David, not Isaiah the prophet, not Solomon, not Ruth, not Deborah, none of those Old Testament figures. John the Baptist, among those born with John the Baptist. And yet there is a coming kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that if you or I should just barely scrape into that, greater than John the Baptist and all that came before him. So there's something about Jesus and his ministry, or at least the Messiah at this point, is Jesus the Messiah? That's the question, right? Are you the one? At this point, those who trust in Messiah are brought into the kingdom of God through Messiah will be counted greater than John. It's an interesting response. And to this John the Baptist, two responses. All the people, even the tax collectors, can you imagine? They included the tax collectors in here. When they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the experts in the law, rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. Two responses. One said, yes, we find this forerunner favorable. The other one says, no. And that kind of creates some tension. Why? Because the stakes are only going to go up as Jesus comes and expresses this idea of Messiah, rescuer, savior. If John's the forerunner, who's coming behind and how does he match or not match your expectations for Messiah? Jesus went on to say, to what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not cry. Here's the interpretational difficulty. Is Jesus the one playing the pipe and John the Baptist the one playing the pipe and the dirge and the culture is not responding in the way that's expected? Or is it the people of this generation, the religious leaders, the experts in the law, are they playing the pipe and, and Jesus and John aren't dancing or the dirge and they're not crying? I don't know. After all my week study, I don't know. It's like in commentaries, like 60-40. So um, what, what I don't know is uh, who this is about, um, but, but I think here's, here's the people, part we can grab onto. There, there's, there's some misconnect, right? So I, I probably lean a, bit, a little bit like religious leaders, Pharisees, experts in law are playing a wedding song, Okay. Playing a wedding song to whom? John the Baptist. Is John the Baptist responding to that wedding tune with feasting and dancing and rejoicing? No, because he's talking about repentance, judgment. I'm going to fast. There's, there's, there's a revolution coming. Look out, right? Okay, well, let's play a dirge to this Jesus guy. Is Jesus responding to that funeral dirge? No, he is feasting. 
He is rejoicing, he's celebrating. And therefore, on account of that interpretation, right? It says, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. What? He's not feasting. Even though they're playing the flute, they're playing the wedding flute. He should be feasting. He's not. And therefore they conclude he has a demon. The son of man, by contrast, right? We're playing a dirge. We're playing a funeral song for this, for this son of man. Is Jesus responding to that dirge? No, rather he is feasting. He's eating, drinking. And on account of that, they conclude he's a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So there's a disconnect. <laughs> the, the people who say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna decide who the Messiah is. We're gonna play a song and see if they dance according to what we want. Oh, they're not, so they must not be Messiah. He can't be the forerunner. Why? Because we played music and he didn't respond according to our design and our desires. And I think Jesus ultimately is gonna twist this back on its head and say, guess what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna play a song for you and we'll see how you respond. And this, this unique deal here, wisdom is pro proved right by her children. Weird expression, can't go into all of it, but essentially wisdom throughout scriptures could be, could be like this wisdom out there. Many times though, wisdom is personified. And in the New Testament, that gets associated with Jesus. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 1 here. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. This is, I mean, this is happening in our passage, right? Jews demanding signs. Look and act how we want you to look and act, right? But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, and here it is, the power of God and the wisdom of God. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. So Jesus ends not with a declaration of, it's me, I'm the Messiah. Come trust in me, come believe in me. He's saying, you're playing a tune and because John the Baptist seems out of tune to you or because you play a tune and I seem out of tune to you, you're disregarding us. But ultimately in time, it's gonna be shown. And just like there was one that was favorable towards John the Baptist and one rejected, you're also gonna have to make that decision about me. You are gonna have to answer the question, am I the one? Everybody who's listening to him in that moment, and by extension, all of us have to ask and answer that question. Is Jesus the one? Is he the one to come? Now let me return to John the Baptist and Mariah Carey, okay? John the Baptist as a forerunner to Jesus in two ways. Look at this. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. To which Jesus would say to John, you have no idea. You think you're gonna be a forerunner based on what you proclaim. And John has very little understanding that he is becoming a forerunner, not just in what he says, but what he does. Because imprisonment, suffering, and death is gonna to come to John. And imprisonment, suffering, and death is gonna to come to Jesus. So John is a forerunner in ways he might not even understand. That it's not just what he says, but what he is going to deal with and engage in. And therefore, and this is something that each of us has to wrestle with, this, this second part, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. John is a forerunner. He is a messenger sent before Messiah, before Savior, Rescuer. One of the greatest vocations ever in human history would be a messenger, a forerunner to Messiah, to the Savior, right? And yet the person in the kingdom of heaven, the one who's least in the kingdom, is greater than John. So this is to say that John in his earthly ministry, John in his proclaiming, John in his being arrested, John in his struggling through and all this stuff of how can this fit with be, me being a forerunner? All of that, all of his life circumstances, God cares about, and yet there's something greater something more important than his 
physical comfort, than his physical freedom. There's something more, something greater. Jesus is talking about the, the physical blindness that he's healed and the lameness that he's brought forward. And he's physically risen people from the grave. And friends, as you go through the Bible and as you read in your personal devotions and your small group, physical points to spiritual. As you see God do things physically, right? That's amazing. But even here, far more consequential is the spiritual connection, the spiritual association. John, you are imprisoned. And Jesus is moved by that and he cares about that. And yet, it's more important for John to associate that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one. Because as he says yes to that, boom, he's automatically brought into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Even John, the forerunner, has to ask and answer that question. You and I have to ask and answer that question. Is he the one? Is he Messiah? Is what he's doing spiritually of greater consequence than even the physical things happening in my life, in, in your life? Because all of us are, God, are, are judging God every part of every day. We put God up there and we, we make judgments. Oh, wait a second. If God were really authoritative and really compassionate and really forgiving, this was what would be true of my life. But that's not true of my life, huh? Does God really care? Does God really forgive? Does God really have authority over these things? If anybody had a claim or a question about that, it'd be, John, I'm in prison. I'm your forerunner and I'm captive. And so it can be that we turn to heroes of a different kind. Other heroes, lesser heroes. But there's something in us that just needs to be connected to a victor, to a rescuer, to a hero. Consider all the examples in everyday life. We look to a politician, a first round draft pick, a newborn baby, a change in bosses, the author who changed my life. Or sometimes we look inside, the hero inside of us. And it's not long before we realize, oh, that politician wasn't all that they were cracked up to be. That first round draft pick, I don't even remember their name. We have aspirations that that roommate will solve all that ails us in our household. That new job, that new relationship, it'll fix it. That new car is going to bring together my world. It's gonna be great. Are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Because here's the deal. You walk with Jesus long enough, we're gonna have our John the Baptist experiences. We have expectations about how this faith life should go. And then it doesn't. And then we start to go, was Jesus the one? Is there a better way? Is there a different hero? Is there a different philosophy? Should I change teachings? Should I deconstruct? Sometimes we think we're better at math. Can I add up this, take away that? Huh, that must mean he's not the Messiah. I gotta trust myself. I gotta look out for myself. I wanna highlight the example of the black church. Juneteenth is tomorrow. Uh, could be one reason I'm highlighting this. Not the only though. Uh, if you're looking for an accessible one hour video, go to Our Daily Bread and look up Juneteenth. Give you a great snapshot of this holiday that we'll celebrate tomorrow. I caught, I caught a line, not from that one, but from a different uh, documentary by Henry Louis Gates Jr. called The Black Church. This is our story. This is our song. A little more for popular content on PBS. You're gonna have the John Legends and Oprah Winfrey's of the world show up. But he said this, and it's a line that I haven't forgotten. No social institution in the black community is more central and important than the black church. No social institution in the black community is more central and more important than the black church. And as I've grown in my understanding and as I've looked at some of the history, there's this place that the black church has held together amidst slavery and struggle and pain and brokenness. And they didn't judge God based on their circumstances. 
They didn't put God to the test or on trial and say, he must not be compassionate. He must not be forgiving. He must not be authoritative because of what we're going through. No, they said, here's the deal. Our oppressors are wrong. Those who have enslaved us are wrong. God is right. And ultimately, God will bring forth compassion, forgiveness, authority, deliverance. He will execute on all of his promises. Maybe here, maybe soon, but maybe not. But that doesn't change God. And one of the ways that they called out to one another was in song. One of those songs had this repeated refrain. When I am alone. When I am alone, when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. As the Israelites were enslaved, as John the Baptist sat in a prison, and as African Americans were enslaved on, our, on these lands, They sang out to one another, when I am alone, when I am alone, when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. What do I want? What do I need? Jesus. Give me Jesus. Is Jesus your salvation today? Is he the one? Do you believe that? With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one you're longing for. Jesus is the hero you're seeking for. Do you believe that? And secondly, can we as Hope Community be a central and important support to one another? Sitting with team small groups this week, talking about accountability. And I think one of the challenges as we come into small group and as we come into this place of accountability is many times we can treat it like almost like a Catholic confessional. Like I just share the bad things. And then those who have heard all that as we sit around this group, we don't know how to respond. And so sometimes we can bring forth some sort of axiom, some sort of tomorrow will be better. Maybe circumstances will change. What if, what if we were the community? That as people express their struggle, express their sin, ask big questions, lamented, experience heartbreak in their lives and hurt and suffering that you have no answer for. We sang. We prayed over this person. Give them Jesus. Lord, give them Jesus in this moment, in this struggle, in this captivity, in this prison. Give them Jesus. Is he the one we need more than anyone or anything else? We're gonna close with a time of worship. I'll invite the worship team forward. It's a unique deal here. This is in part, this this table, both wedding feast and funeral dirge. You take the cracker, it's Jesus' body broken for you. The cup is his blood shed for you. This is a death that we come and remember. And yet we do so celebrating because it is the way by which we're united to Christ. In the taking of these elements, in faith, we believe that his death is sufficient to unite us to God, that there is a wedding associated with this, this weird combination of funeral and wedding. Other ways we'll worship is through song. We invite you to stand and to sing out, to sit and be reflective. We have people that will be available to pray for you about anything going on in your life. You might have prisons that we're unaware of, that you feel stuck, you feel trapped, and we just want to sing over you. Jesus, come to this person. Give more of yourself to this person. That's, that's what we're doing in prayer. We can't fix it. We're not going to give you the right answer. We'll pray for more Jesus in your life. And then if you want to give, we've talked about that previously. Let me pray for us. God, right now, before this great assembly, you as authority, you as compassionate, you as forgiver, you as rescuer, reveal yourself to this group, Christian and non-Christian, new church person, old church person, somebody who's excited about these words or hates these words. Oh Lord, give them 
you. More of you, Jesus. More of you. When they are alone, when they are facing captivity, when they are facing struggle, suffering, pain, more of you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Feel free.